so I'd like to introduce our next speaker, who this is her first time actually presenting, I think, but she's been a judge before. So she's been at the actual um, competition. Um, our next speaker, Samantha, has um, joined us from the Department of Public Works and Environmental Services with Fairfax County. And she is an ecologist and she's going to be presenting on aquatics. She is an expert in aquatics. So if you have any questions, go ahead and put those in the chat. Or I think she'd also be okay if you unmuted yourself to ask a question. Um, with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Sam so she can go ahead and lead her presentation. She'll also have some time at the end for other questions. Um, and that'll be the end of our night and the last of our main topic presentations. All right, thank you. Um, and I don't know if the chat is easily going to pop up if I'll be able to see them. So if someone does write in the chat, if someone could read that question out to me um, in case I missed it. Um, but yeah, I'm Sam Doofy. I'm an ecologist um, within the stormwater planning division in the Department of Public Works and Environmental Services. Um, and I, within stormwater planning, I work in the watershed assessment branch. So my job as an ecologist is to basically monitor the health of the streams and lakes in Fairfax County. So tonight I'll be talking to you about the aquatics um, resources portion of Envirothon. I'm sure you're all pretty um, familiar with the water cycle. I think we learned that pretty early on. Um, but I just wanted to quickly go over this graphic um, where we can see how water is stored within our planet and the phases that it moves through in the water cycle. Um, so oftentimes you'll hear evaporation and transpiration talked about together. Um, and that's basically just the change from liquid water to the um, water vapor. Um, evaporation is just from the water itself and transpiration is when the plants lose um, the water into the vapor phase. Um, then we have condensation where you have the vapor going into the liquid phase. Um, that's when you're seeing clouds, which then we know will lead to precipitation, which can be um, rain or snow or anything like that. Or in tomorrow's case, a mix of a bunch of different kinds. Um, but working within stormwater, we don't only focus on rain, but snow is also considered stormwater as well. So we um, we have a role in, when it comes to snow and snow removal and things like that too. Um, and then we have infiltration, which is when our water, our precipitation or our runoff is soaking into the ground where it can either be stored within the groundwater or still groundwater can move as well. It just moves a lot slower than surface water does. Um, and then I also just quickly wanted to touch on water conservation because I saw that it was one of the topics that you guys need to familiarize yourself with. Um, and I know that on the East Coast, we might not think about water conservation as much as people do, say, in California or in Arizona and places like that. But um, it's still important to be aware um, that conservation is the careful use and preservation of water supply. And this includes not only the quantity of the water, but also the quality of water. Um, the water that we have on earth is what we get and it is always returned the water that we use, but it's not always returned to the same location in the same quantity or in the same quality. Um, so fresh clean water is a limited resource for us. Um, if you look at this top graphic here, we know that nine, about 97% of earth's water is within the ocean. So that's not usable fresh water for us. Um, only about 2.5% is fresh water. And then even when you look at this column here, how fresh water is broken down, most of it is still within glacier and ice caps. We have a lot in groundwater and a very small percentage of our fresh water is surface water. Um, and then you can look in the third column how the surface water is broken down as well. Um, so water conservation is important because we wanna make sure that we have availability for our current population also our future populations taking into account things like climate change and population increase. And then I just put this graphic on the bottom. Um, it's from 2015, but it is how basically how the United States uses water in billion gallons per day and all the different ways that water is used. Okay, so what is a watershed? Um, in this graphic here, we have three watersheds, A, B, and C. And we can see here 
This purple dotted line is the watershed divide, and you can see that the watershed divide is located on the top of um, basically this mountain range. So topography is what determines our watersheds. Um, so basically when it rains, anything that falls on this side of this purple dotted line is going to drain to this body of water. The same within the center here, and then on this side. Um, and when you're thinking about protecting a specific water body, so say we want to protect this stream right here, um, we don't only want to think about looking at the water body itself, we need to think about managing the entire watershed that drains to it. Um, and the example that I'm going to kind of touch on a little bit tonight that I'll keep going back to is the Chesapeake Bay TMDL. TMDL means total maximum daily load. Um, this is something that was passed by the EPA in 2010. Um, and basically what a total maximum daily load is, it's like a diet for a water body. So it says this water body, so the Chesapeake Bay can handle this amount of a certain pollution every day and still meet its water quality standards. Um, and basically the Chesapeake Bay wasn't meeting its water quality standards. So what the EPA said is that the six states and DC, which all drained to the Chesapeake Bay, had to make reductions um, in the pollutants um, within their state so that it would hopefully meet the water quality standards. Um, so how big are watersheds? So that kind of depends on how you want to think about them or look at them. Um, watersheds, you can think of them as like measuring cups, how one fits within the next one. Um, it really depends on the scale that you want to look at. So, for example, this is the Fairfax County Government Center. This is where I go to work, or at least I did a year ago until I work from home every day. <laughs> um, and this turquoise line here that's outlining it is the outline of the watershed. Um, and so it's a small watershed. It basically, you know, it just involves some of the land around the government center, the parking lot, and the building itself. Um, our government center is located in the upper portion of the difficult run watershed. So this here is the outline of Fairfax County. We have 30 major watersheds that you can see outlined here. Um, and difficult run drains this way into the Potomac River. So you can see we're located up here um, in the upper portion of the difficult run watershed. And so this is just looking at watersheds at a, a larger scale. And then if you wanna go to an even larger scale, um, this here is the outline of the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So you can see the states that it involves in this gray shaded area. Um, we have New York, Pennsylvania, a little bit of West Virginia, Virginia, Maryland, um, Delaware, and DC. And um, the reason it's so important that all states do their part and you manage the whole watershed is because say Maryland and Virginia could be doing a really good job making their reductions in pollutants, but then what if you still have Pennsylvania that's not making reductions, then the Chesapeake Bay won't be able to meet its water quality standards because it really depends on the entire watershed. Okay, so this is an exercise that appears usually each year on the Envirothon test, um, and it's delineating or outlining um, watersheds in the topographic map. So, you know, we said that watersheds are defined by topography. So, um, this is something that it takes a little bit of time to get your eye trained, I think, personally. Um, but basically, the closer together that these lines are, it just is steeper the slope. So closer together, steeper the slope. And then these closed circles here are peaks of hills or mountains. And basically when you connect all the different peaks and when you take into account the um, steep slopes, you can, you're able to outline the watershed. So I know that there are some resources online um, and ones that you can practice on, um, but usually this does appear on the exam. Um, next is how we classify the size of streams. Um, so this is called Stoller Stream Order. And basically when two streams of the same order join together at what's called the confluence, um, the stream order increases. So you can think of um, the first stream order as headwater streams. Th these could be like little seeps in the forest um, that could be considered a headwater stream, first order. Um, so when two first order streams come together, that forms a second order stream. And you'll see here that we have a second order stream and another first order stream, but it still remains a second order stream. It only changes to third order when we have another second order, 
stream come in and then continue on to fourth order. Okay, so stormwater management, um, that's what my department focuses on. Um, and this is the process of controlling stormwater runoff that drains off rooftops, driveways, roads, and other impervious surfaces that do not allow water to permeate into the ground or soak into the ground. Um, so basically impervious surfaces are any hard surfaces like sidewalks, parking lots, roads, highways, buildings, houses. Um, so everything here in this graphic that's outlined by a color is an impervious so you'll see a lot of this here. We have parking lots and roads, a major highway, townhouses, and then we have these green areas where water is able to soak into the ground. Um, but everything outlined is where water, when it hits that surface, it can't soak in. It's just going to run off. Um, so this is the journey of stormwater. I'm sure you've all seen storm drains on the side of roads. They are everywhere. Um, and during a rainstorm or say when snow and ice are melting, um, that's where the runoff is going to go. So when it rains and it hits the ground and it, and it doesn't soak into the ground, um, it'll eventually run off down the road into a storm drain. And it could either come out of this is called an outfall. Um, after going through a series of pipes, it'll come out of an outfall into your nearest stream or lake. Um, and the stormwater within Fairfax County and in many places is not treated before it enters our streams. So it goes directly from the road and whatever it picks up with it um, goes through the storm pipe system and then ends up in a stream. Or um, there are things called best management practices like wet ponds or bioretention facilities that um, after it enters the storm drain, you can enter these facilities where it gives a chance for the water to be held there, it lets some sediment settle out. Um, it also releases the water slowly into streams instead of just going through the storm drain system where it goes directly into streams. Um, so best management practices are ways that you can manage stormwater within a watershed to try to help slow down the water and give a little bit of um, water quality treatment. It's still not being clean, but it's still giving a little bit of treatment before it enters our streams or lakes. Okay, so how does land use affect runoff? Um, so first, we're going to look at natural ground cover here. Um, this is an area that has no development, um, no houses or anything. It's just your forested land. Um, and you see you have very minimal runoff. You have a lot of infiltration, both deep infiltration that's going to go into groundwater storage. It also has a lot of evapotranspiration. And then we move to the 10 to 20% of impervious surface within a watershed. You see a little bit more runoff, a little bit less of the others. Um, and studies have shown that even around 10 to 20% impervious surface um, in a watershed is when we start to see degradation of our water bodies. Um, and then we can move on to 35 to 50% of impervious surface. So now we have 30% runoff and less infiltration, less evapotranspiration. Um, so here with the 30% runoff, you're having a lot more water on the ground. It has less places to soak into. And then here in 75 to 100% impervious surface, you can think of this as um, a downtown area um, that has little to no green space whatsoever. And at this point is when you'll really start running into issues. You have 55% runoff and a lot less, nearly no deep infiltration. Um, so I just wanted to have you try to think of areas in Fairfax County that might meet some of these different conditions. Um, I would say Fairfax County really doesn't have many of the natural ground covers, um, but feel free to put them in the chat or to just think about different examples in Fairfax that might meet these. But it might be interesting to share some of your um, ideas with the other people on the call. Okay. So now we're going to move on to a hydrograph. Um, basically, this is the measurement of water flow over time. And we have developed land by, um, shown by the dotted line and undeveloped by the solid line. So we have our rainstorm that starts. And then here you can see in a developed landscape, the peak flow is reached very, very quickly. Um, and it's much, much higher 
than the peak flow in an undeveloped landscape. So you can see that this peak flow happens gradually, hits the peak and then gradually goes down, whereas in a developed landscape, it happens very quickly and then also drops very quickly. So why do we think the peak flow rate occurs more quickly in a developed landscape? And what type of problems do you think could occur from flow rate increasing so quickly? You can put things in the chat or say them out loud. It doesn't matter. So we had some ideas about what might happen when the flow rate increases so quickly. We're wondering if maybe it would cause a lot of runoff and then maybe that would carry pollutants faster. Yeah, so we definitely have a lot more runoff. Um, and what happens when water doesn't have anywhere to go? So say we have a lot of water running off, but it doesn't have anywhere to go. What type of problems occur with that that we've seen? I mean, we don't get a lot of these, but hurricanes, we see some issues with that where the water, I mean, those are extreme cases, but. Um, we've got someone who said flooding. Yes, exactly. So. In a developed landscape, you'll tend to have more issues when it comes to flooding because now you have a lot more water coming all at once and it doesn't have anywhere to go. Okay. A good example of that, it might we might not remember all the way back, but I believe it was the July 8th storm that hit us and we had a ton, a ton of water come all at once. And actually at one of the district stream monitoring sites, it was a stream restoration site. And when we had all of that water come at once, which we were not prepared for, it ended up destroying some of the restoration and some huge boulders, much bigger than myself, were, were knocked over and that had to be repaired. So that could also cause not only you know flooding damage, but then also somebody has to pay to fix that again. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it was that same storm um, up in Pimmit Run. I think that's like McLean area. Um, I think that's the one I'm referring to. Yeah, a road was actually washed out. Um, and so that neighborhood was pretty much closed off except for the people that lived there because the state Department of Transportation had to repair the road. Um, okay, so other impacts of increased imperviousness. Um, like we talked about, we have higher um, peak discharges and flooding. We, we see fragmentation of the forest corridor. We see increased stream bank erosion because you now have a lot of runoff moving a lot more quickly than in a natural scenario. Um, and this is a great example. This is my coworker, Takesha. And, you know, the stream used to be up here, but over time with a lot of flow and a lot of water, it eroded all the way down here. Um, channel enlargement, because these streams are, they're not used to this amount of water. Um, basically, so when these streams start getting a lot more water, a lot more quickly, the stream starts adjusting itself. It starts to become deeper. It starts to become wider because it's trying to handle all of this extra water um, and this leads to other issues like encroaching the stream will start eroding into people's backyards. They lose their yards underneath the fences. Um, we're getting a lot of sediment in the streams because of that. It, it causes a lot of other issues. Um, it also can wash out the habitats within the stream. Um, we lose a lot of our typical pool and riffle structures and I'll talk more about these in a little bit. Um, so we're losing some habitat, which can then lead to decreased bi biodiversity. Um, we also see increased water temperatures. So if you think of a big mall parking lot in the middle of the summer, it's super, super hot. And then we get one of our great DC area rainstorms that happens in 15 minutes, a lot of water all at once. Um, and it hits that parking lot and the, the water gets super hot, quickly runs off into our streams. And now you have a lot of warm water being washed into the streams. Okay, so this graph is comparing impervious percentage in a watershed to an IBI. And so pool riffle structure, um, I'll get to in a little bit, it's basically just features of a stream and I'll explain those more um, in a few slides. Um, 
So this is Impervious First IBI. IBI is Index of Biotic Integrity. Basically, this is a score that we're able to give streams based on the organisms that we find um, in the stream. So um, benthic macroinvertebrates, these can be um, aquatic insects or snails or worms, anything that doesn't have a backbone that we can see with our eye and live at the bottom of streams. Um, we monitor those and they have varying tolerances to pollution. So, and I'll get more into this as well in a few slides. Um, but basically when we sample streams and we look at what type of benthic macroinvertebrates are present and how many there are, it generates a score for that part of the stream. So when we compare that score to percent of, percentage of impervious, you can see as impervious percent increases, our index of biotic integrity decreases, which means we're seeing less biodiversity, um, we're seeing less organisms altogether, um, we're seeing worse water quality. Okay, so when we monitor, what indicators do we use? Um, for my job and what we look at are biological, chemical, and physical indicators. I just wanted to put some of the native Fairfax County critters. We have a red breast sunfish and a Dobson fly. This is a picture of a very old water chemistry meter. Um, with these, we measure pH, temperature, dissolved oxygen, um, conductivity, which is basically just measuring um, dissolved ions within the water. We also do bacteria um, E. coli monitoring. So biological monitoring, um, this is the use of organisms to assess or monitor environmental conditions. And this is usually to determine the relative health of an aquatic e ecosystem. So in this top picture, we're doing something called um, electrofishing, where we temporarily put electricity into the water. Um, this temporarily stuns the fish. And then you can see us, a few of us have nets here. We quickly scoop the fish up, put them in a bucket to get them out of the electricity. When we're finished with our site, we identify them and then put them back into the stream. Um, on the bottom, this is my coworker Danielle sampling for benthic macroinvertebrates um, using something called a D net. So this has a very fine mesh on it and it traps the benthic macroinvertebrates in the net, um, but allows enough space for water to move through. Um, so you can see she's sampling here an area of a stream, which would be called a riffle. So it's the fast moving part of streams. Um, with lots of cobble, um, where you'll find a lot of benthic macroinvertebrates. So what do they tell us? Um, the reason we use benthic macroinvertebrates as a way to monitor streams is because if I were to go out to a stream tomorrow and take a sample of water and measure pH, temperature, dissolved oxygen, that doesn't give me much information about the stream over a long period of time. It basically just gives me a snapshot and tells me what the water quality is like at that moment in time. So it doesn't really tell me what the water quality was like last week, last month, last year. But benthic, benthic macroinvertebrates do give us more of an idea about water quality over time because they live the majority of their lives in streams. Um, they reproduce, some reproduce in streams, so we can look at, um, you know, how many are present and what life stages are we finding, things like that. Um, and they're not very mobile either, like fish. So if the water quality is bad, they can't just leave the area and find a better place to live. Um, they're kind of stuck, and if they can't survive um, in the water quality that they're in, then they likely will die and will not be present in that stream segment. Um, and like I um, touched on earlier, they have varying tolerances to pollution. So some of these benthic macroinvertebrates can tolerate um, a lot of pollution. These are things like um, leeches or worms, snails. Um, they can tolerate a lot of pollution or bad water quality. We have some that are moderately tolerant of pollution, so they can handle a little bit, but they can't handle really bad water quality conditions. An example of that would be this damselfly here. Um, it's basically the cousin of a dragonfly and a caddisfly here. I would say these are moderately tolerant to pollution. And then we have organisms that are really sensitive to pollution and require good water quality. And that's something like the stonefly here. Um, so basically when we're sampling a stream, 
If we're finding only tolerant organisms like leeches, snails, and worms, or something called midges, then we know that the water quality is probably bad. But if we sample a stream and we find a lot of sensitive organisms, or we find a variety of sensitive, moderately tolerant, and tolerant, because tolerant can live anywhere, even in good water quality, obviously. If we find a good variety in a lot of sensitive organisms, then we know that that water quality is good because they wouldn't be able to survive otherwise. So where do we sample for macroinvertebrates? Um, this is basically just zoomed in to the picture of Danielle from before. She's sampling um, the stream bottom here. You can see the water's moving really quickly. This would be called a riffle. Um, it's that fast moving portion of a stream, like the rapids, but of streams. Um, and so the benthics live under this cobble here. So what we do is basically disrupt this cobble, kick it up, um, and then the benthics that are living underneath will be washed into our net. Um, we also sample these things called snags or leaf packs. So basically, if leaves have been established long enough within a stream, benthic macroinvertebrates may choose to live there. So we'll sample those as well. Same thing, we kind of just disturb the area to try to dislodge them from where they are. And then here underwater, this is a picture of vegetated banks um, and root wads. So we sample these as well. And actually, you'll find um, usually some damselflies in these vegetated banks. So we sample a variety of habitats because different macroinvertebrates live in different habitat types. So we want to get a representative sample. So by sampling multiple habitats, um, we're able to do that. Um, and then I just wanted to kind of showcase a few of our native species here in Fairfax County when it comes to fish. We have some fish like the fantail darter here and a rosy side dace. Um, these fish on top here, they prefer shallow and fast moving water. So think of those riffle areas. Um, and you can see here with the rosy sides mouth, it um, is angled upward. And that's usually a sign that when a mouth, um, when the fish's mouth is turned upwards like that, that it spends most of its time like right below the surface of the water. Um, so yeah, they like those fast moving riffly areas. And then we have the American eel and a white sucker. And these fish are bottom dwellers. They like to spend a lot of their time in the deeper and more slower areas of streams, which would be the pool. So when I talk about riffle and pool structure, um, in a stream, you want to see a variety of riffles of all different lengths and widths. And you also want to see um, a variety of pools. You want to see some shallow pools, some deep pools, some big pools, some small pools, um, because different organisms prefer different habitats. And again, with the white sucker, you can see its mouth turns down. And that's, again, an indicator that that fish is a bottom dweller and spends most of its time um, in that sort of habitat. And then just a few of the non-native fish in Fairfax County. Um, we have the northern snakehead, which got a lot of press when it was first um, discovered in the Potomac watershed. And then the goldfish, which is also another big invasive species that we find here. Um, so how do they get here? Um, you and a goldfish at the fair and it gets really big or you don't want it anymore. So, hey, there's a stream in my backyard. I'm going to put my goldfish in the stream where it will be happy. Um, they can happen like that. Um, they could be sold at live fish food markets, which I believe is where the northern snakehead came from. Um, they're originally from, both of these are actually originally from Asia. I actually think the first snakehead in the Potomac River watershed was, it got here because a man went to New York City, he bought one from a live fish food market and brought it back to Maryland for his sister, but his sister didn't want to eat it. Um, guess it wasn't her cup of tea. So he kept it in a tank as a pet, but then eventually it got too big because they can get pretty big. And he was familiar with this pond behind the shopping center that he would go fishing at. So he thought, okay, I'm just gonna, you know, put it in this pond, um, but eventually they can reproduce and um, these fish can also spend a lot of time out of water. They can survive a lot of time out of water. And if you get a big flooding event and let's say that pond is close to a stream, then that pond can, uh, the surface of the pond can come up and now you have that fish out of the pond and it can get over into the stream. So there's a lot of different ways that it can happen. But when they first got here, um, I think a lot of biologists thought that they'd be a lot bigger of a problem. And 
than they actually turned out to be. So they're still a non-native species, but they're also not dominating the ecosystem as much as biologists were initially um, afraid of happening. But it's still illegal to transport them while they're alive. So, um, so yeah, what, what impact do they have on the ecosystem? Well, like John mentioned in his presentation, they usually don't have any natural predators, so they don't really have that um, pressure to keep their population in check. Um, this leads to more competition with native species for resources such as habitats and food, and it can um, overall just disrupt the food web. Um, and I'm not going to get into the food web too much, and I know John touched on it too, but basically, when you're looking at a food web, just remember that the arrows represent the transfer of energy, um, not who is eating who, but the transfer of energy. Um, and, you know, everything is balanced within a food web, so when you have something new, like an invasive species or a non-native species come in, um, it can tend to throw off the whole thing if there's really not a good um, native predator or something like that, or if it takes too much of the food source for an, a native species, then that can throw it off too. Okay, so um, when it comes to physical monitoring of streams, what we look at a lot is we just want to see is the stream stable um, and does it have suitable habitat. So this graphic here is basically like if you're looking down at a stream, it's an aerial um, diagram. So we have the riffle here, like I said, that's, those are those fast moving parts with the cobble. Um, it eventually flows into a pool. The pool are these darker blue areas and then into a riffle again, into a pool. We wanna see that type of structure. We wanna see a variety. Um, and riffles provide, riffles are really important because not only do they provide habitat, but they provide an area because there's a lot of um, disturbance with the water flowing over the rocks. It actually allows for diffusion of oxygen from the atmosphere to get into the water, which the aquatic organisms need. So riffles are really important to get the oxygen into the water. Um, and pools are important because as a slower area, it allows for a place for the sediment to drop out um, so that it's not continued to be carried downstream. Um, sinuosity is basically the curviness of the stream. So this white line um, like is the thalweg here, but you can see it's very curvy. And the thalweg is the deepest part of the stream. So basically how you measure sinuosity is you just compare the length of this line compared to how long of a line it is straight through, and that gives you your sinuosity. And that's really important. It's a natural stream pattern, um, but it dissipates energy, it slows down the water. Um, it's definitely more slow than if the water was flowing like in a straight line. Um, something to look at this graphic, um, we're looking for floodplain connectivity. So basically, when there's a big enough storm and um, we're getting a lot of water into the streams, we actually want the water to get out of the stream onto the floodplain. A lot of people think of flooding as bad, but that's because it's happening where we live and where our houses are, or where our cars are, but naturally we do want water to get out of the stream during floods. We want it to get onto the floodplain and that's because it dissipates energy. Um, when that excess water gets out of the stream, you know, there's less energy within the stream, which means there's gonna be less stream bank erosion, less loss of habitat, less disturbance overall. Um, so then this is kind of like the water chemistry part that we're going to get into a little bit. So first up is temperature. Um, this varies during the day directly with air temperature, um, but it's affected by a few other things as well. Um, for example, the vegetation that is right near the streams. Um, obviously, water beneath a forest canopy where it's nice and shaded is going to be cooler than in open areas. So here you can see most of the stream is shaded, so it's going to have um, pretty cool water temperatures, but a stream like this where, yeah, you have some trees on this right side, but on this left side, you can see it's open. And as the sun moves throughout the day, um, this stream is going to get a lot more sunlight than this one would. So it's probably going to have warmer stream temperatures. Um, and cooler water actually holds more dissolved oxygen. So that's really important to have cooler water temperatures. And um, temperature also affects biotic metabolism. So animals, 
aquatic animals can get really stressed out if the water is um, way too hot. So, you know, they're working extra, extra hard and it's a stress to their system. Um, next up is turbidity, which is a measure of water clarity, or you could say a lack of water clarity. Um, so turbidity is caused by sediment, uh, suspended sediment, algae, or some other dissolved pollutants. Um, and with suspended solids in our streams, it can reduce the light penetration that reaches the streams. So therefore, it's going to reduce some productivity within the stream. So say you have some submerged uh, vegetation and it's no longer getting any sunlight because the water's too um, cloudy, those plants might not be able to survive as well anymore. Um, these suspended particles also provide attachment sites for pollution. So, and I think one example that I list on the next slide um, or in a couple slides is uh, the pollutant or the nutrient phosphorus binds to sediment. Um, so when we have phosphorus uh, bound with sediment, it can be carried downstream. Um, and this here is a satellite image from the United States Geological Survey. This is the Chesapeake Bay. And this river here is the Potomac River. Um, this was taken after a rainstorm. I know that most of you probably know that the Potomac is usually a brown color. Um, so you can see in this satellite image that this is actually all sediment from a rainstorm um, that got picked up on the satellite image. So um, you could see how like when the water is that turbid, uh, it would be hard for the plants living there to get any sunlight. And again, also turbidity and suspended solids can also just stress aquatic organisms um, when the water is not as clear as it needs to be. So due to the volume, sediment is one of the most devastating pollutants entering streams. So when I talked about the Chesapeake Bay TMDL earlier, how the six states in DC need to make reductions, um, sediment is one of the three major pollutants that's part of that TMDL. So the EPA said to these states, you need to Put in best management practices, you need to find ways to reduce the amount of sediment entering your streams, your waterways, which eventually drain into the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and sediment can sediment in streams can be um, a result of erosion. So again, here's a picture of a stream bank that is severely eroded. Um, and this can be affected by soil texture, how steep the slope is leading up to you know, these streams, the length of the slope. Um, the bank's exposure to the water. So does it have any protective coverage? Does it have any big boulders protecting it? Does it have vegetation covering it? And at this point, the stream bank has nothing. Um, so it's just going to continue to erode every time water gets up to this level and flows down. Um, and then this would be like an example of what it looks like downstream when, when the landscape kind of like flattens out or the topography kind of flattens out and the slope isn't as steep anymore in the stream. The sediment's all still just going to settle somewhere. So, you know, you can see this is a very sandy and silty stream bottom, and that's not natural. That's coming from stream bank erosion upstream. Um, and then obviously disturbed land erodes more easily. So think deforestation, construction, or agricultural um, operations. That land is going to be much more unstable and prone to erosion. So some impacts of sedimentation, like I said, um, pollutants can bind to that sediment and then move downstream, which is, you know, one of the case, one of the examples that's happening in the Chesapeake Bay, like it's eventually being um, carried down the watershed and settling out there. Um, so it's bringing pollutants along with it. Um, it can smother aquatic organisms and their habitat. So when we go out and monitor streams um, for, for their physical condition, one of the things that we look at is called embeddedness. And this is the extent to which the rocks or the substrate on the bottom of the stream are covered or sunken into the silt, sand, or mud. So basically this picture here, um, this image on the left is a stream that is very embedded. So you can see that the substrate on the bottom of the stream here is completely covered by silt and sand. Um, so this is smothering the aquatic organisms that live there. It's filling in all the crevices and spaces that they would need to live and survive there. Whereas you can see on the right, um, you can see all the spaces, um, you know, the organisms under these rocks, they're not buried by sand. 
Um, so this would be a much healthier looking stream bottom than this one. Um, when it comes to lakes and reservoirs and even streams, uh, sediment can reduce the volume capacity. So, you know, our lakes would fill in with sediment and now it's filling in with sediment and can no longer hold as much water as that reservoir was designed to hold. So now that's a problem because it's not holding as much water. Um, and this can lead to increased costs. So in terms of the reservoirs, you now have increased costs for maintenance because you need to dredge and dredging is when you're removing that sediment from the reservoir to bring the capacity back up to what it needs to be. Um, and then just water treatment in general. So, you know, a lot of Fairfax County gets our drinking water from the Potomac River. Um, so, you know, the worse the water quality, the harder it is to treat it for what we need to use it for. Um, so that's just another thing to keep in mind. Um, next up is dissolved oxygen. So in fast moving streams, dissolved oxygen, that's what DO stands for, um, is rarely limited. We have those riffly areas that I said are like allowing for the diffusion of oxygen from the atmosphere into the water. Um, that turbulence and air friction facilitates that diffusion so that it keeps it at levels that is that are necessary for um, aquatic life. Um, vegetated streams and, and streams that have submerged aquatic vegetation, they have that vegetation photosynthesizing, which also provides oxygen, um, but it can become reduced in like very slow rivers and lakes, water bodies with high organic content. So think a lot of leaves and just a lot of organic matter like that, when that decomposes, that uses up a lot of oxygen. Um, and very warm waters, like I mentioned, uh, colder water holds more dissolved oxygen. So in the slower, warmer rivers and streams, you're gonna have lower oxygen. And then this chart on the right is just showing some aquatic organisms and the level of oxygen that they require. You can see mosquito larvae that live in streams hardly require anything, so you'll find them in a lot of areas. Um, carp and catfish are typically fish that you would find in slow moving water, so it makes sense that you know, they don't require as much dissolved oxygen as some other species do. Um, and then you move up here to trout, you know, trout, uh, they require cold water, they require water that has a lot of dissolved oxygen. So if a stream doesn't, isn't able to have that, then the trout can't survive. Um, so yeah, I just thought that was interesting showing how different organisms, you know, tolerate, we talked about how organisms um, have varying tolerances to water quality. This is an example of that. Um, so then nutrients. Um, Nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus are essential for plant growth. They're very essential for the aquatic food web. They basically form the basis of that. Um, you know, the aquatic plants need nutrients to help grow. But basically, when you have an overabundance of nutrients, it can have harmful health and environmental effects. Um, again, back to the Chesapeake Bay TM TMDL. Nitrogen and phosphorus are the two other major pollutants that the EPA told the states you need to reduce. So you need to reduce nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment um, entering your waterways, which eventually drain to the Chesapeake Bay. Um, so sources of nutrients, where do these come from? Why is there an overabundance? Um, they come from fertilizer, so um, things that we put on our lawn or agricultural areas, um, stream bank erosion. So that's a big issue in Fairfax County, not so much agriculture, we don't really have that anymore. Um, but stream bank erosion is a big issue. All the phosphorus, all the phosphorus that's bound to that sediment is being carried downstream. Um, it can come from sewage or animal waste. And, um, and then in terms of nitrogen, it can also come from the atmosphere. So eutrophication, why is an overabundance of nutrients a problem? Um, so this can lead to algal blooms, which is basically just a complete over, over ex explosion of algae in the water column. Um, and you can see in these pictures here, like these are water bodies that have really been impacted by algal blooms um, because there's an overabundance of nutrients um, allowing them to keep growing and growing. So this can eventually lead to dead zones. And this is when the algal blooms die. Na they die off naturally um, and they sink to the bottom of the water body. And 
the decomposition process there, you have the bacteria that are decomposing them, and those bacteria are using up a lot of dissolved oxygen to decompose um, that algae. So because it's using so much dissolved oxygen, it's taking that out of the water and leaving little to no oxygen left for um, other aquatic organisms. So that's a huge issue that um, shows up in the Chesapeake Bay, that shows up in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and it happens, you know, a lot of times during the summer um, when you have w warmer temperatures too. Again, like you, uh, the warmer water can't hold that dissolved oxygen very well either. Um, and another issue with eutrophication is harmful algal blooms. So some species of algae can release toxins into the water and they're also toxic when they're consumed by other organisms. So if your algal bloom is mainly um, composed of harmful species that release toxins, that could be really dangerous to not only the aquatic life, but any wildlife that comes into contact with that water. I've heard some really sad stories about people who have let their dogs swim in water bodies and then the dog becomes infected. Um, it can cause problems to the liver, to this, it can cause skin irritation. Um, so that's a really big issue as well. And then again, it still causes the same issue when the harmful algal blooms die off, it can lead to dead zones too. And then, like I mentioned earlier, reduced light penetration. So when you have those algal blooms, um, the sunlight can no longer get into the water column and those plants underneath the surface uh, can no longer survive. And then any animals that depend on them as a food source or a habitat might not be able to survive either. So how do pollutants get into our water? So um, there are basically two ways from point sources. So you can think of these as like factories that have permits that are allowed to release a certain amount of pollutants. Um, you know, there's a pipe, you can point at it, you can say, I know that that pollutant is coming from that pipe. Um, and then we have non-point source pollution, which is coming from a general area. You can't really point at it and say, that's where the pollution is coming from because it's coming from a general area. Um, and a good example of that is urban stormwater runoff. For example, it rains on this neighborhood. Yes, it does go into a storm drain and it, it does come out of a pipe into the stream, but because the runoff and the pollutants came from this entire area, you can't really point and say, that's where the pollutant is coming from. So it's important to know the differences between these two point sources and non-point sources. Um, and then just to quickly touch on some valuable aquatic resources, um, streams and especially headwaters, like this picture here would be considered a headwater stream. It might start at a small spring. Um, this here would be considered a vernal pool. So that's like a seasonal pool. Those are really important um, in the springtime when some amphibians are laying their eggs, they'll use these vernal pools to do that. So it's important to have those. Um, floodplains are important, like we said, it's important to have that area next to the streams to allow the water to come out and dissipate energy. Lakes and ponds, estuaries, um, which is what the Chesapeake Bay is, and riparian buffers, which we're going to go into. So riparian buffers is the area of land that's um, right next to a stream. So here we have our stream, our riparian area is right here, and then you know we move up into the uplands um, past that. But riparian areas. Um, are highly productive and diverse vegetative systems. So they can be grass, shrubs, um, trees, or a combination of all of those, but um, the best riparian buffers would be a forested one that has the overstory, the understory, um, that provides a great benefit to the streams. Um, they have a lot of value. They provide flood control, improved water quality, and ecosystem functions. So when it comes to hydrology, um, this is the stream here, and then we're going to be looking at this area here, the immediate land next to the stream. Um, this vegetation is going to slow that runoff down before it can get to our stream. It's also going to allow, like these long roots are also going to allow pore space um, within the land for the water to soak into. Um, so you just overall have less water making it to the stream in general. So we can take up that runoff, that precipitation, the vegetation slows down the water. If you think, um, if you're in the middle of the woods and it starts raining, um, you're probably gonna 
it's going to take longer to get wet than if you were to just stand out in the open because you have all the trees above you and all of its leaves slowing it down as well. Um, and then so water is infiltrated into the surrounding water table instead of all of it making it to the stream. Um, and they provide some benefits, water quality benefits as well. So this is not a good example, but these plants take up excessive nutrients that are in that runoff. So if we go back to the last one, you know, these roots are doing a great job at taking up that excess water that is also probably carrying nutrients along with it. Um, the roots help stabilize the stream bank. So therefore you have less erosion and less sediment within the stream. So you can see here, this one is eroded and you really only have this little grassy area on top of it. And you can see that this stream does not have a riparian area. It has some trees in the distance, but immediately next to the stream, you can see that there's not really anything there. So there's nothing really protecting the stream bank either. Um, and this is just gonna continue to erode over time. There's no protection. And up here, um, you know, that's not gonna last much longer. Over time, you know, this these little grassy shrubs are not providing that much protection for that stream bank. Um, also, vegetation provides shade and regulation of stream temperatures. So you, you know, this one has a lot more trees on the side. It receives less sunlight throughout the day, whereas this one is clearly more wide open. It's going to have higher stream temperatures as well. Um, and then as far as ecosystem function, they provide important wildlife habitat. Um, so even just like, you know, trees that die and fall down and are laying on the ground, those provide habitat for salamanders or bugs. Um, what can be done to preserve a riparian buffer, or is it just naturally occurring and we can't do much to increase its presence? So actually in Fairfax County, I don't remember which year that it happened, but they passed something where it was an attempt to preserve the riparian buffer. So along pretty much every perennial stream, so perennial stream means streams that are flowing all year round, um, the land directly adjacent to it is actually owned by the park authority. Um, and that was an effort to kind of preserve that buffer. Um, so that's really important. Um, not everywhere has that same rule. Um, and sometimes, you know, that rules there and someone might not know it. A new homeowner might not know that. And they could say, well, I want a bigger backyard and I want to see the stream. So maybe they'll mow their lawn right up to the stream, or maybe they'll take down some trees just because they didn't know. Um, but it is, it is naturally occurring. I know that there are also um, certain events that organizations will do to do plantings within riparian areas. So they'll go and plant some native species to try to increase the diversity there and its function. Um, that was a good question. It is naturally occurring. It's just whether or not humans decided to preserve that space or not. Um, and then, um, again, the riparian area sustains dissolved oxygen levels and the leaves and other organic matter from the riparian area provide a food source for the aquatic ecosystem, which will kind of brings us into our last slide, um, which you'll want to familiarize yourself with this. Um, I'm not going to go completely into detail on it, but it's called the river continuum concept. And it's basically when you think about how a stream changes from its start at the headwaters to the end of the stream at its mouth to wherever it empties into, um, that stream is going to change physically from the start until the end. Um, so when it changes physically, it also leads to the chemical systems and the biological communities changing as well. So things that are going to change throughout the whole stream are size of the channel, slope of the channel, size of the substrate um, at the bottom of the stream, the types of organisms that are there. This, these are plants, insects, and fish, temperature and turbidity. So if we think about the headwaters, um, you know, those are typically in a forested area, um, hopefully, um, with a steeper slope. So these streams are usually um, pretty steep. So they have lots of riffles. They have a lot of dissolved oxygen. They have cooler temperatures because they are completely shaded. Um, they have less sunlight. So they actually don't have a lot of um, aquatic vegetation that's growing because there's not enough sunlight. So the energy source there is going to be the organic matter that I was talking about. So the leaves like that, that get into the stream, that's gonna be the energy source. And then 
that kind of dictates the type of organisms that are going to live there. So you have a lot of organisms called shredders and collectors, which um, get their energy from that organic matter. Um, and then again, you'll have the trout because they like those mountainous streams. They like the cold temperatures. They need a lot of dissolved oxygen. As you move to midstream, your um, slope of the channel is going to get a little bit less steep. It's going to get a little bit wider. You're going to have more sunlight now, which means now you're going to have some plants that can start photosynthesizing. And those plants provide a new food source. They provide new habitat and therefore support different organisms. Um, so now you'll see things like grazers and collectors, and you're not really seeing as many shredders anymore because, um, you know, those are typically found in the headwater portion of streams or the mountainous streams. Um, and then finally, when you're um, getting towards of the river or stream, um, it's going to be very wide. It's going to be very slow moving. It's probably going to be more turbid because you're going to have a lot of sediment that was carried there and is having a chance to kind of settle. Um, it's not really being washed away anymore like it is up in the headwater streams. Um, and now that it's more open, you're going to have a lot more phytoplankton, so algae. You're not going to have as many submerged plants anymore because now algae are probably going to be the more dominant plant there. And again, now look how many collectors, the, uh, the proportion of collectors as there was before. Again, because they, um, you know, needed dif different types of food sources, um, just different conditions. And then we also mentioned how the catfish doesn't need much dissolved oxygen and they're typically found in slow moving waters. So yeah, you'll find something like catfish and carp down in these slower, more turbid um, areas. So try to familiarize yourself with this um, a little bit more. I know a quick Google search brings up a lot of good information about this, but basically these are the things that are gonna change as you move from the headwaters to the mouth of the river. And that is all I have. So if you guys have any other questions, um, feel free to unmute or put them in the chat. Um, is are there other ways besides briefly electrifying the fish to catch and sample them a hoop or trap nets? How do you fix? Okay, so first I'll enter answer the fish question. Um, so we use electrofishing because we are trying. Our goal is basically to catch every fish in that segment of stream. Um, and electrofishing is the easiest way and most efficient way in doing that. Um, I know other ways that people monitor are by like catch and release things like that, or they trawl some nets, uh, do a fish trawl behind a boat where they catch them in a net and then they'll identify and release them um, in like lakes and things like that. But um, I know it sounds upsetting, but it's just a very, very temporary, temporary stun of electricity. We catch them quickly, get them out of the electricity and into a bucket of water where they're not being um, in electricity anymore and then identify them and put them back in the stream. And most of them end up okay, um, but it just is the most efficient way to get an idea of how many fish are there and what types are there. Um, and then how do you fix a severely eroded deep stream bank? Just plant trees, does that restore the stream or just keep it from eroding further? So like I said, in Fairfax County, our issue when it comes to nutrients and sediment um, doesn't really come from agriculture. Like that would, I would say that is Pennsylvania's biggest challenge is like agriculture when they need to make their changes um, for the Chesapeake Bay DMDL, TMDL. But in Fairfax County, what we do a lot of is called stream restoration where we actually um, hire contractors, we design these plans and it's a very complex process that I'm still learning myself and a lot of work goes into it, but basically they rebuild the stream channel. Um, they won't do an entire stream, but they do a very long segment, um, like about, let's say 1500 feet. They'll restore the stream channel. So they'll actually raise it back up again. Um, they'll put in new rocks, they'll put in new wood structures. Um, a new thing that they're trying to do is actually, they're trying to provide more habitat for the aquatic organisms. It used to be very focused on 
stability purposes only. They wanted to keep it from eroding. And now they're kind of trying to focus on like, okay, let's stabilize the stream. Let's rebuild it, but also let's try to add some in, add in some good habitat so that we can try to bring back the aquatic life that is missing. Um, but yeah, the, and actually they do have to take down some trees in order to get this massive construction equipment in. But when they're finished, they plant a lot more trees um, that will eventually grow up and provide that stability that trees provide for our streams. But that's mostly what Fairfax County is doing to make our reductions in nutrients and sediment. We're trying to prevent that stream bank erosion. <laughs> 